Welcome to the Every Nation Dorado Congregation, where we see a transformed society that advances the kingdom of God through discipleship in the word, presence, and power of God. Let's take a look at some of the announcements for the upcoming week. And to ensure your safety and the safety of others, we ask that you wear your masks at all times during church services and church events. And tomorrow will be our men's only prayer day. So we invite all the men to attend this prayer from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Our We Care Ministry is running a winter clothing and blanket drive from April until the end of May. You can please deliver all these items to the church office or Sundays at church. Our church office times is Monday to Thursdays from 8 to 5 p.m. and on Fridays from 8 to 1 p.m. For more information, you can contact Julia or Rita at 0811-286-381 or 081-250-5559. On the 15th of May, we will be having a men's gathering with a theme titled, How Faith Works. This will happen from 8.30 to 10.30 a.m. You can register on our events page or at the information table. Do you want to grow in your walk with God? Well then, you should join a connect group. You can collect a Connect flyer at the information table during church services to find out more information about the Connect groups that are available throughout the city. And we still have City on a Hill merchandise available. You can simply just visit the information table during the church services to purchase one of the items. And we will be having youth summer school during the May school holidays. So if you are a youth between the age of 13 and 18, you can join for tutoring in maths, physics, biology and chemistry. This will be taking place every Saturday from 12 to 2 p.m. The dates are 8th, 15th and 22nd of May. Please note that the COVID-19 safety regulations will be adhered to like wearing masks, sanitizing hands and social distancing. Today is Communion Sunday. We will be sharing communion together today after the message. So why not take a moment right now to prepare your communion elements. And visit our website for any additional information at www.envinton.org. Hello everyone and welcome once again to our online church. It's always a blessing to be together. I want to bring you greetings from everyone around. If you've been at Connect, if you've been at our live services, it's always a wonderful, wonderful blessing to be together in fellowship. Uh, Obviously, there's so many developments going on with regards to the whole COVID-19 scenario. But once again, we want to encourage you not to operate in fear, but to continue to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. I also just wanted to praise God and thank him for the wonderful service that we had last week. If you missed out on that, please remember to go back uh, on our YouTube and find that message. We laid hands on some new leaders and spoke about the importance of leadership in our context in our church as well. And then uh, together with that, while we were speaking about servant leadership, I just wanted to take the time today to say thank you to everyone in our church community that serves as a volunteer. You know, volunteers are the engine and the heart of our church. Many times people only see what happens in front of the camera, but there are many things that are happening behind the scenes, uh, literally, and those are the heroes that we want to celebrate today. So if you are near to a volunteer, if you yourself are a volunteer, give yourself a round of applause today. You are an exceptional, amazing person, and we commend you for your labor of love. The Word of God says that God is not unjust to forget your labor of love in that you have ministered unto the saints of God. And it's important that you distinguish that this is not just serving anybody. You're serving the the bride of Christ, and there is great reward in that. I also want to encourage those who are not volunteering, who are not serving, please make it your deliberate aim to serve somewhere with your gifts, with your talent, with your time, 
with your resources in such a way that you're able to be an active part of the body of Christ. And then uh, also just a reminder concerning the announcement that came up ahead of the men's prayer meeting. Tomorrow we have this, the first Monday of every month is men's prayer meeting. We're fasting during the day and then coming together in the evening at 5.30 to pray for our nation, to pray for our families, to pray for our church and to pray on some personal matters as well. So don't miss out on that if you're one of, one of the men. And then I want to encourage you to join a Connect. That's so, there's so much happening in the Connect. That's a place where you prepare yourself to get baptized. That's a place where you get directed in terms of your spiritual growth path that we've, we as elders have made available. That's a place where you share your heart a little bit more deeply than in the congregation. That's a place where people are able to support you if you're sick or if you're in need. That's where, well, that's where family is really felt. And I want to encourage you to join a Connect. And if you've been in a Connect for a long time, start a Connect and begin to take care of others. And then today we will have our communion as well. It's our communion service. At the end of the message, we will do that. So gather together your, your juice or wine and your, your bread and we will have communion at the end. So I'm going to pray for us and we'll get into our message. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that your word brings so much peace and joy and fulfillment in our lives. It is food for our souls, nourishment for our spirits. Lord God, that your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. You direct our steps. And today I thank you, Lord, as you speak to us through your word, that we'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we're continuing with our series, or, or, or even concluding with our series on the atonement uh, that we started about five weeks ago. This is the fifth week. Uh, we had a skip last week where we spoke about leadership. But the first week of the atonement series, we dealt with the Passover and the origins of the Passover. The second week, we spoke about the scapegoat and the lamb. The third week, we spoke about the power and the evidence for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the foundation of our faith. And then, uh, and, and let me just say this, it's such an important message. If you've got any friends that don't believe in Jesus, ask them to listen to that and uh, give them more material to consider as they move towards their faith in Christ. And then uh, today we're dealing with eternal forgiveness, which is sort of a culmination and a result in our practical lives of the atonement. And this is the question that we're going to start with. Did Jesus succeed in what he came to do on earth? Did he succeed? And you might ask, no, okay, what did Jesus come to do? The Word of God says that Jesus was manifested to deal with the sin of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son as an atoning sacrifice so that whosoever believes in him, John 3, 16, should not perish but have everlasting life. And the, 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 the death or the perishing came from sin. The word of God says um, that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So that's what Jesus came to do. He came to sacrifice his life to deal with sin, not as an end in itself, but dealing with sin so that we could be reconciled back to God. That was the aim. If you deal with your sin, but you are not reconciled back to God, then you are missing the point of what Christ came to do. He came to restore relationship between you and God, and by that brought eternal life by it. And so we're going to go through certain principles today under the subject of eternal forgiveness. Why? Because the atonement in dealing with our sins, and we've looked at it from the time of the Passover into the scapegoat, into the resurrection, all of that was dealing with our sin. And compared to the Old Testament, where sins were dealt with annually, and whenever you sinned, you had to bring a sacrifice in the form of a dove or in the form of a lamb, in some kind of atonement, we now have the once and for all atonement by Jesus Christ. And the proof of the fact that he succeeded in dealing and atoning for the sins of the world lies in the fact that he only had to do it once. 
The repetition in the Old Testament was a testament to the fact that it didn't work effectively and it had to be redone more and more often. So the first principle is that Jesus atoned for all sin. I'm reading from 1 John chapter 2, the first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. It says, my little children, or believers and dear ones, I'm reading from the Amplified Bible, I'm writing you these things so that you will not sin and violate God's law. Very important. And then it says, if anyone sins... We have an advocate who will intercede for us with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, the upright, the just one, who conforms to the Father's will in every way, purpose, thought, and action. Then verse 2, it says, And he, that same Jesus, is the propitiation, propitiation for our sins, And that means the atoning sacrifice that holds back the wrath of God that would otherwise be directed at us because of our sinful nature, our worldliness, or our lifestyle. And then it says, not for ours only. So he is the, Jesus is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for us, but not for us only, but also for the sins of all believers throughout the whole world. And then it says, actually, in in another version, it says, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. So the atonement of Christ is not only for the believers, so to speak, or for the Christians. Jesus on the cross was making a global atonement. He was making an atonement for all the world, for the sins of all mankind. And so we see here principle number one that the atonement, the price that Jesus paid, the sacrifice he made was for all sins everywhere. (laughs) All sins everywhere throughout the whole world. That's why he came because there's no other atoning sacrifice that will address the sins of anyone else. So Jesus covers the whole creation. Then number two, principle number two, there's no forgiveness without blood. And I've said this in our first week when I was introducing the fact that we're going to deal with eternal forgiveness. We have people who are not even saved. They don't have a relationship with God. But because of their conscience, when they do something wrong, they tend to say, oh, God, forgive me. Oh, forgive me, God. Wow. Sure, God must forgive me. And so they have this religious sort of uh, action that they take and words that they state concerning the forgiveness of God, they even ask God for forgiveness. But forgiveness doesn't come by asking. Forgiveness doesn't come by asking. Let's look here at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. It says, in fact, under the law, almost everything is cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness or remission, no, neither release from sin, and it's guilt, no cancellation of the merited punishment. It says it right here in the word of God, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. It's not about asking for forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness without the shedding of blood means that you are still unforgiven in the divine uh, context. From God's point of view, it's not your asking for forgiveness that takes away your sins. It's the shedding of blood. And and this is what John the Baptist said about Jesus. He said, behold the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And in the Old Testament, the shedding of blood was the shedding of the, the blood of animals in order to atone and deal for the forgiveness of the sins of mankind, of the Hebrews specifically. But in Christ, we now have the forgiveness of sins on the basis of his blood. Number three, principle number three, Jesus' atonement was once and for all. (laughs) This is so radical. This is so radical. So what Christ came to do on the cross, he is not going to do again. So that means if sin is going to be dealt with, he only was going to deal with it once. And the Bible speaks about this very clearly in Hebrews chapter 10. The whole book of Hebrews is very good for you to understand the comparison between the Old Testament and the New Testament and the realities of what Christ has done. 
and what he's brought in for us and what we can experience. I'm reading also from the Amplified Bible. From verse 1, it's a lengthy uh, piece of scripture, but we are going to go through it systematically, try and follow the argument. The point here is that Jesus' atonement was once and for all. All right. It says, for since the law was merely a rude outline or a foreshadowing of the good things to come, the law of Moses or the system of the Old Testament, instead of fully expressing those things, it can never by offering the same sacrifices, the lambs and bulls and goats, sacrifices continually year after year, make perfect those who approach its altars. So what he's saying here is that in the law, there was a foreshadowing of what Christ was going to fulfill. But in the law, all the sacrifices were done annually, year by year, but they could not perfect the worshipers. Verse two, for if it were effective, if it were, right, would these sacrifices not have stopped being offered? This is the question that he asks. If, if the sacrifices that they were making actually dealt with the sin properly, then they wouldn't have done it every year over and over. They would have stopped. And then it says, since the worshipers had once for all been cleansed, they would no longer have any guilt or consciousness of sin. This is massive. This is massive. He is saying that the sacrifice repeated is pointing to the fact that the sin and the guilt is not dealt with. It had to be a remembrance over and over. It was a temporary system. And so if it was effective, then the worshipers would never ever make another sacrifice and they would not have guilt or sin consciousness. Wow. Verse three, but, but as it is, these sacrifices annually bring a fresh remembrance of sins to be atoned for. Verse four, because the blood of bulls and goats is powerless to take away sins. Very clear. Verse five, Hence, or therefore, when he, he, Christ, entered into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but instead you have made ready a body for me to offer. He's quoting from Psalms. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no delight. This is a quotation from Psalms where David is speaking, but it's actually portraying Jesus saying that, look, you are not satisfied with offerings and sacrifices, so you prepared a body, Jesus born of a virgin, prepared a body so that I could do your will. Then verse 7, he says, Then I said, Behold, here, uh, here I am, Coming to do your will, O God, to fulfill what is written of me in the volume of the book, the prophecies. Verse 8, when he said, just before, you have neither desired nor have you taken delight in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, all of which are offered according to the law. So the whole Old Testament system, what he's saying here is that God was not actually satisfied with that. And so Christ came to fulfill a better sacrifice because of that. Then verse 9, he then went on to say, Behold, here I am coming to do your will. Thus he does away with and annuls the first and former order as a means of expiating or removing sin so that he might inaugurate and establish the second or latter order. He takes away the first testament so that he may institute the New Testament because the First Testament was inferior and inadequate and God was not pleased with it sufficiently. So Jesus removes that and he establishes the second. Then he says in verse 10, and in accordance with this will of God, we have been made holy. Have you ever heard this? In accordance with this will of God, we have been made, past tense, we have been made Holy, what does holy mean? Consecrated and sanctified through the offering made once for all of the, of the body of Jesus Christ, the anointed one. Let's continue. 
Verse 11, furthermore, every human priest, look here, very important the illustration he's about to make concerning the priests and the sacrifices. Every human priest stands, so they stand at the altar, right, of service, ministering daily, very important. So one, they are standing. There are no chairs in the, in the tabernacle because if you're sitting, it means your work is done. Your work is never done because the sins are never atoned for. So you're standing, and then what happens? You minister daily, sacrifices daily, dealing daily, offering the same sacrifices over and over again, which never are able to strip from every side of us the sins that envelop us and take them away. So if the priests are standing, doing work every day in order to take away sins, but they can't because the sacrifices are ineffective. Verse 12, whereas this one Christ, Jesus, after he had offered a single, look at the comparison. After Jesus offered a single sacrifice for our sins, for all time, he did what? He sat down <laughs> at the right hand of God. This is massive. So from every point, he's telling you the work is done. Sit down because the work is done. If the work was not done, he would not have sat down because according to the law, the priest cannot sit if the sins are not done being atoned for. But our Jesus, our high priest is sitting right now and it points to the fact that our sins have been fully atoned for. Let's continue reading. He continues to make the argument, verse 13. He says, then to wait until his enemy, so he sits down, and he waits until his enemies should be made a stool beneath his feet. For by a single offering, look here at the wording, by one single offering, he has forever completely cleansed and perfected those who are consecrated or set apart and made holy. Do we believe this? Have we ever heard this? That Jesus forever completely cleansed and perfected us. That's massive. And, 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 and because of that, he's not going to stand up and come and deal with your sins. He's sitting, he's chilling. Because in his mind, the work is done. Then he goes on, verse 15. And also the Holy Spirit adds his testimony to us in confirmation of this. Now look here, as the writer of Hebrews is writing in chapter 10, he stops himself as he made this argument by revelation. He stops himself and says, the Holy Spirit now wants to add a feature. Now listen to what the Holy Spirit wants to add. <laughs> this is amazing, okay? Then he says, for having said, verse 16, this is the agreement or the testament or the covenant that I will set up and conclude with them after those days, says the Lord. I will imprint my laws on their hearts and I will inscribe them on their minds or the inmost thoughts and understandings. And then he goes on to say, look what the Holy Spirit is saying. Their sins and their lawless deeds or their law breaking, I will remember no more. Wow. So we've got a witness from Jesus being seated at a, as a high priest after he's done his sacrifice. And then we have the Holy Spirit's testimony concerning the fact that our sins have been dealt with to the point where the Holy Spirit says, their sins and their law breaking, I will remember no more. Wow. So that means from God's perspective, the, when he looks at us, the perfection that he sees is tremendous. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. And so we continue reading. Verse 18, it says, Now where there is absolute remission or absolute removal or absolute forgiveness and cancellation of the penalty of these sins and law-breaking, there is no longer any offering made to atone for sin. It seems obvious, of course. I mean, if the sins have been atoned for, why continue the sacrifices? 
If the sins are not atoned for, you cannot sit, you cannot rest, continue the sacrifices. But once the sins have been atoned for, forgiven, 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 then stop with the I'm trying to get forgiven exercises. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's continue reading. This is massive. I want to encourage you, go and read for yourself in your own Bible. Maybe you think I'm reading from some new, new version that you've never heard this before. Then it says, verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have full freedom and confidence to enter into the Holy of Holies by the power and virtue of the blood of Jesus, um, this is important because this is the result that is supposed to happen. If we know that we have been forgiven, there must be great confidence in us to approach God. Because the issue was that God is life, God is everything good, God is everything virtuous, but man was evil and sinful. And that separation because of sin is what caused the death of man. But now, if man can have access to God, he has access to life, and he is meant to take advantage of it with such boldness because the separation that held him away from life itself is now removed and taken away. This is awesome. And so Jesus' atonement is not like the Old Testament atonement. We don't deal with our sins yearly, 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 all the time, all the time in the sense of forgiveness. We'll touch just now on how we deal with our sense of guilt and condemnation when we do sin. We'll see what the Word of God says about that. But we must understand that the, the peace of mind that the Hebrew had after the one sacrifice that he made at the temple, when he went home for a year, he didn't wonder whether God was with him, whether God was blessing them, whether God was protecting them, because the sacrifice was covering everything. And many of us, we don't have half of or as much of that confidence, and yet the sacrifice that was made by Jesus was way, way, way superior than the one that they had in the Old Testament. Now, principle number four, forgiveness is announced to you. We're reading from Acts chapter 13 in the New Testament, verse 37, and this is uh, the preaching by the Apostle Paul. And he starts saying uh, to a multitude where he was preaching, but the one God raised up did not decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed or announced to you. Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you could not be justified through the law of Moses. And then look at verse 40, very important. So beware that what was said in the prophets does not happen to you. And what was said, look, you scoffers or mockers, marvel and vanish away because I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe even if someone were to explain it to you. And this was the temptation that people are more happy to do their own sin management thing and try and cleanse themselves instead of realizing the good news of what Christ has done, accepting it by faith and allowing that to work a transformation in their hearts. So forgiveness must be announced. There are many people who have never heard that Jesus died for them so that they can be forgiven and innocent in God's eyes. They've only heard that they are going to go to hell because of their sins. And no one is telling them, but someone actually intervened and there's a standing invitation towards eternal life that they don't have to pay anything for because Jesus paid the full price. This is awesome. So forgiveness must be announced. And I want to encourage each one of us right now. You need to announce the forgiveness of sins from God. You need to begin to tell it the same way that we announce the resurrected Christ. We need to announce that there has been this event that took place that took away the sins of the world. And anyone that wants to approach God for eternal life can now come freely. And in that same scripture, it goes on to say that the Apostle Paul then was approached by the whole community and said, please come and talk to us about this next week again. So there's just a hunger from the lost, from people 
to know about this eternal uh, atonement and forgiveness that is available in the Lord Christ Jesus. Right. So now we're going to go on to principle number five, which says forgiveness is only for admitted sinners. So it's very important that you realize that you must admit your state of being a sinner. You must admit your state of need before forgiveness can be applied in your life. We're reading here from the epistle of John, 1 John chapter 1. Starting from verse 1, I'm reading on through to verse 10. Look at what he says. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, he's speaking of Jesus, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Remember, verse 2, the life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life with, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Then verse 3, we proclaim, we announce to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship or be associated with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy, we write this to make our joy complete. Then he says, verse five, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light, in him is no darkness at all. And verse six, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with God, with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Verse 8, very important. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, if we admit our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Very important. And uh, many people have this idea that um, this scripture is something that applies to the believer every day. Of course, there is the sinful actions that we are taking on a daily basis. And the question is, okay, how do I address that? Because the scripture says right here in verse 8, that in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So the question is, if we don't confess our sins, then he is unfaithful and will not forgive our sins and purify us. And some say, yes. So that means we must confess our sins in order to be forgiven. Is that correct? That is incorrect, all right? And you say, no, but pastor, how can you say it's incorrect? Why? Because the forgiveness of, sin, of sins is not contingent on our confession. The confession here is that in order for you to be forgiven of something, you must first admit that you did it. There was a group of people called the Gnostics, right? They believed in the spiritual realm and they felt like the physical realm is to be completely disregarded. So therefore, they didn't believe that there was such a thing as sin. So they didn't admit that they sin at all. Now, how do you save someone who doesn't recognize their problem? And so they first had to be told, look, you can't say that you have not sinned. Otherwise, you make God out to be a liar. You must first admit, I'm a sinner. Yes, I am. And then, once you are a sinner, then the gospel is good news to you. Then you can receive forgiveness. What kind of forgiveness? For one day? No, eternal forgiveness. But that eternal forgiveness only starts when you admit your need and you come to Christ for that salvation. So the word of God here is telling us very clearly that the world must first admit their sin before they can receive Christ. 
If you say there is no sin, then you, you will even say, then why did Jesus come at all? Why did he die on the cross if there is no such thing as sin? Jesus came specifically because there was such a thing as sin. And then once we realize that, Lord, I'm in need because I'm a sinner, then he says, come to me and I will be faithful and just to forgive your sins and to purify you of all unrighteousness. This is very important. So uh, principle number five, forgiveness is only for admitted sinners. All right? Now, let's go even further into our personal ex experiences. Principle number six, forgiven. Are we forgiven or are we going to be forgiven? <laughs> are we forgiven? Remember, the Old Testament uh, sacrifices took away sins for one year. That's how effective it was. And it seems like the sacrifice of Jesus only takes away sin until our next sin. And you know what? For those who believe that, no, I must first confess my sin before I can be forgiven after they have been born again. So now you're born again, you're in Christ, you've been forgiven of all your sins, but in your daily life you believe that unless you confess your sins to some, someone or to the Lord, you can't be forgiven. What about the sins you don't remember? There are some sins you don't even realize that you are doing and you will never confess them. You will never even ask for forgiveness for, the, for them. Are those unforgiven? If that's the case, then you are probably on your way to hell. That means that that is inferior compared to what they had in the old covenant. What Jesus did is he bore our sins. The Bible says all of our sins were laid upon him. Which ones? Only the ones that we confessed or remembered? No, all of our sins. The eyes of God, nothing escaped him. He took, he looked at your whole entire life, saw all the sins, all the mess, all the dysfunction, all the thoughts, and he took all those and laid them upon Jesus and he crushed his son in your place for all the sins that you could have possibly have thought of potentially committing. Wow. This is the good news. No, pastor, how can you say that people are that forgiven? It's not what I'm saying. That's what the Bible says because Jesus is that good. It's the blood that we applied for. If we were using the blood of goats and animals, I could have said to you, yeah, there's a little bit of doubt concerning the extent, but there is only one way to be forgiven of your sins, and that's the blood of Jesus, and he doesn't do a half job. He does a proper job to the point where he sat down and said, it is finished. It is fully paid. It is fully satisfied. Hallelujah. Now let's look at, at uh, principle number six. And this one is a scripture that makes people feel like, no, but it means that I'm not forgiven yet. I have to first ask for forgiveness and things like that. Matthew chapter 6. And let me say this. When it comes to people, you have to ask for forgiveness because people live in the time. But with God, he already saw what you did, right? And what he expects of you is repentance, not asking for forgiveness because the forgiveness is in getting born again and coming into Christ. All right, there's much to say about that. Now, principle number six, are we forgiven or are we going to be forgiven? This is the Lord's prayer, Matthew chapter six, verse 12 to 15. Many of us have prayed this, right? We've prayed this, Lord, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thou will uh, give us the daily bread. You know, we just say it like a, like a poem. And so in verse 12, he says, and forgive us our trespasses or our sins, as we forgive them that trespass against us. Is that how you ask God for forgiveness every day? When you're saying, oh, God, forgive me. <laughs> Are you at that point saying, oh, God, forgive me as I have forgiven others? No. People don't even factor their, that in. They have this um, practice of asking God for forgiveness as if that's what really deals with the forgiveness apart from what Christ has done. And then they don't even factor in that they should say, oh God, forgive me as I have forgiven others. And there are many of us that we have not forgiven everyone everything. And if you die right now, what has the atonement of Christ done? Pastor, are you saying that we should live in unforgiveness? No, <laughs> I am saying 
Okay, let's get to the next scripture, which will show how should we then approach it. And some say, no, but pastor, these are the words of Jesus. He taught us to pray like this. Let's make a distinction. I remember I taught a, I taught a series, series called The Balance uh, Between Law, Grace, and Faith. Go and listen to that. It speaks about the difference between the Old and the New Testament and how the New Testament doesn't start before the cross because the testator must die before a New Testament is brought in. And so it starts at the cross. The New Testament starts at the cross. This prayer is before that time, and Jesus is born under the law to fulfill the law. So many of the things that he's saying is truths, but some truths are Old Testament truths, and some truths are New Testament truths. So I, I can't explain that now. Go listen to that message, and if you've got any other questions, ask your connect group leader. But it's very important that you understand that here he's talking to people who are not born again. The disciples were not born again because the way to the Holy of Holy had not yet been open. <laughs> so he's speaking to people who are doing eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, under the law. God only forgives you according to the way that you forgive others. You say, no, I'm not convinced. Okay, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. This is the Apostle Paul, and he writes this, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, look here, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That sounds like the opposite. I thought that God forgives me once I forgive others. But here it says, no, God has forgiven you and therefore you can forgive others. This is the gospel. Not that I am saving myself by my works. No, that what the work of Christ saved me and causes me to live like someone who is saved. Hallelujah. And you say, no, it's not enough scripture. Okay, Colossians <laughs> chapter 3 verse 13. What does it say? Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has any grievance against someone. Then look here. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. He's talking to me in my state of unforgiveness and telling me that the Lord forgave me and therefore I should forgive the way that the Lord forgave me. So it can't be a contradiction here on the one side, I'm believing that no, that um, if I don't forgive others, God will not forgive me. But on, the, on this side, God forgave me and that's why I should forgive others. Which one is it? It's this one. <laughs> Why? Because of what Christ has done. <sighs> this is very good. <laughs> because there are some of you, 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 you believe that you are far from God because of your unforgiveness. If you are born again, God has forgiven you of all your sins. Therefore, that grace that has been given to you, go ahead and give it to others. Now, principle number seven, forgiveness is already in Christ. Let's read here Ephesians chapter one, verse seven. It says, in him we have redemption. Look at the tenses. In him we have redemption, deliverance and salvation. Through his blood, the remission or the forgiveness of our sins and offenses according to the riches and generosity of his gracious favor. In him we have Am I forgiven? I have redemption. I have forgiveness. Then, what am I asking for? <laughs> oh God, forgive me today. Lord, I spoke against my brother. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. <laughs> okay. So, at that point, God is now meant to forgive you. What happened in Christ? Nothing. So, because nothing happened in Christ in your mind, God has to give you forgiveness in installments. And what happens if you don't realize that you've done something wrong against God and you don't ask for forgiveness? What happens then? Are you still forgiven? What did Christ do? Are you born again? If you're born again, what did Christ do? You say, oh, it's not enough scripture. Let's look at second, uh, Colossians number, uh, chapter 2, verse 13. He says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, look here, having forgiven 
all our trespasses. Past tense. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Where are my sins? Nailed to the cross. Where were my sins? They were laid upon Jesus. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God. And you might be saying, no, pastor, this is how I pray. This is how I usually pray in the evening. I pray, I thank God for the day. I thank God for everything that he's done. And then I ask God, God, please forgive me for saying this and for doing that and for doing that. Now, it is important that you realize that God expects you to repent. But repentance and forgiveness are not the same thing at all. You can repent of something that you did to your spouse and they not forgive you and you will still be sorry. You will still change. If a person is truly repentant, whether God forgave them or not is not the issue. The issue is they have godly sorrow, they have remorse for their sin, and they are repenting. So what's the right way to pray? This is the better way to pray. He would say, God, I realize that what I've done there was wrong. And I know that your Holy Spirit is convicting me concerning that. Lord, I'm sorry. So what you're doing is expressing your sorrow. Sorry means I'm sorrowful. I'm sorry. You apologize. Lord, this is not the right way. Lord, I'm sorry. You, you will be tempted to say, oh, forgive me <laughs> because of the tradition that we have. No need. What you can then say is, and I thank you that you have forgiven me in Christ for even this. How merciful you have been to me. And what does that do? It doesn't focus you on the effectiveness of your prayer. It focuses you on the effectiveness of the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And it causes your heart to warm, warm towards the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to do what he did for us, not for himself. Not for himself. And so wherever you are, if you're in a place where you're compromising and in sin, maybe you're not born again, get born again. Don't just ask God for forgiveness every day. You can go to hell having asked God for forgiveness. You need to get born again. But once you are born again, then you are forgiven in Christ. From that point, all you do is you repent. You repent. And repentance is not, oh God, forgive me. No, repentance is, oh God, I'm sorry, I'm going to change. Oh God, I'm sorry, help me to change. Oh God, I'm sorry. That's what you should be doing. Have you ever had uh, friends or, or spouses who come to apologize to you, and this is their apology? Um, yeah, I know, I know what I did wasn't good, so uh, forgive me. And you're like, no, I'm not going to forgive you. Then, I, ah, then I'm not sorry. <laughs> have you ever heard people saying that? And many people have this approach of trying to get the forgiveness, to get off the hook. But they don't have any interest in repenting at all. And God is more interested in your repentance because your forgiveness is a done deal in Christ. He's not here dishing out forgiveness cards every night as people are praying. No. What he's doing is in your repentance, he is restoring and cleansing you of even the things on your conscience that you have done wrong. This is the way to sanctification. So we're not saying never ever bring up your sins. No. Whatever you're doing wrong, Bring them up. Confess them to a friend. Confess them to your pastor. Confess them. It's very healthy to bring it to the light. But then don't come and ask God for forgiveness because in Christ you have forgiveness. If you are not saved, get born again. If you are saved, thank him for the forgiveness. But then what must you do? Repent. Repent. What does repent mean? Change your mind. Change your attitude. Change the direction in which you're going. Whether you're forgiven or not, repent. And especially because God loved you so much that he sent his only son. Therefore, repent. This is what the apostles, the apostles preached. They said, repent, therefore, because of what Christ has done. Repent, therefore, and you will receive the forgiveness of sin. You will receive in Christ all the forgiveness that you need better than what the Old Testament saints had.
And so we're going to go into a time now of just having some communion. Hallelujah. You remember that in communion, that's where we start. Oh God, forgive me. Forgive me, God. <laughs> in our tradition, what are we saying about what Christ has done? You know, has, has Christ not done anything concerning your forgiveness? Christ has done everything concerning your forgiveness. And that's why we approach the communion table. And what must we do? Repent. If God convicts us of something, repent. So let's take right now the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get your elements together. The word of God says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, uh, take this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you do this, you declare my death. You declare the Lord's death. You proclaim that someone died for me. So why are you bringing your forgiveness story here? The death is proof of the forgiveness that you have in Christ. Now eat it, partake of it. And so let's partake of the bread. Jesus was whipped and bruised and broken for your healing and for your restoration. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And then it says he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. The one where we say, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. And therefore, I will also forgive others. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Therefore, I will also love others. Thank you, Lord, for being merciful to me. Therefore, I will also be merciful to others. And it says that this blood washes away sin. It's the cleansing blood. It's not doing it now. <laughs> it happened on the cross. Then we are in Christ experiencing that cleansing because of the gift of righteousness. So thank you, Lord, for your blood. That it may be applied on our conscience, Lord, that we will understand that our sins have been dealt with. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. I pray that you help us, oh God, out of our religious traditions into true relationship. You are not a man that forgets that you forgave us and all of that. You see all things, God. You know best what happened on the cross. And you know that those who are yours in Christ are in the forgiveness of sins. For those who are watching, and they are not born again, I pray that today they'll make Christ their, their propitiation, their mercy seat, their scapegoat, their sacrificial lamb, so that they can also have complete forgiveness of sins, eternal forgiveness, a security that the Jew and the, and the Hebrew did not have. We have it because the Son of God was crushed in our place. I pray, Lord, for revelation. I pray even as the, the good news is coming forth to people that they are forgiven. Their sins are forgiven. That they will know, Father, that that will strengthen them to live a holy life. To live a life that is consecrated and set apart unto the Lord. Who, 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 who is able to say, no, I, I will therefore sin because I am forgiven. No. Because we are forgiven, our hearts are now to live for the Lord. So I thank you for that grace, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's somebody there you've been struggling with habitual sin and you just couldn't get out of the cycle. And I feel the Lord saying uh, from Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It says that sin shall no longer have dominion over you for you are not under the law of condemnation. You are under the grace of forgiveness and that you will begin to say in your heart but I've been forgiven and walk out of that prison of sin and condemnation. And Father, I pray for each one of us that we'll have a wonderful, blessed, blessed week and that you'll speak to us more and more. In our prayer time especially, I can see all of us stopping ourselves in our prayers now. Lord, for, I mean, Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> and beginning to repent 
and saying, Lord, I thank you that you have forgiven me in Christ and beginning to celebrate what we have in Christ. So may, may you have a wonderful, wonderful week. Stay safe and we'll see you soon. Thank you for listening. For more information about this podcast and other resources, please visit envintook.org.